I'm really excited to share this video from International Women's Day 2020. I was invited to be a keynote speaker at the Girls Academic Leadership Academy in Los Angeles. So I got to give a great presentation to about 600 future girl bosses. It was also really great because our homeschool collaborative was able to attend as a field trip for our Speeches That Changed the World class. The Gala School had a beautiful program that started with a lovely presentation of the Star Spangled Banner. I had a really lovely introduction by the student council president. And this year, Mimi launched a YouTube channel, Mom Editor by Mimi Narte, where subscribers can follow her life as a wife, mother, activist, coach, and philanthropist. Please welcome Dr. Mimi Narte. Shout out to my 11-year-old daughter, Laya, who was the cinematographer. This can go any higher for me. <laughs> All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And happy International Women's Day early. I'm early. I'm really so excited to be with you today, and I was really honored when I was contacted about giving this keynote. And I've spent quite a bit of time over the past few weeks reflecting on which aspects of my personal story that I really wanted to share. Um, I've had an eventful life, as you've heard, even at 38 years old, and I'm grateful. But when you hear my biography and you read the cliff notes of my success, it sounds like a charmed life. Once upon a time, there was a little girl she was smart, she got a couple of Ivy League degrees, she was talented, she played in the World Cup, <laughs> she met and married her Prince Charming, she was nurturing, she had two lovely, lovely children, she was empathic, she helped the world, she and her family lived happily ever after the end. But by a show of hands, is there anyone here who suspects that maybe it wasn't just like that? <laughs> Is there anyone here who thinks that there might have been challenges, obstacles, hurts, failures? You would be correct. And while I don't have enough time to talk about my entire journey, even the brief details that I'm going to share today can begin to add some color and some dimension and some conflict. And all of these things have made my experience authentic and they've made me grow in my own unique brand of femininity. So here is a quick version of my real life fairy tale. My dad is from a country called Ghana in West Africa, and my mother is from Mississippi. I was born in Jackson, Mississippi. Yep, uptown funk. Bruno Mars is factually accurate. I have always been smoother than a fresh jar of Skippy. <laughs> when I was eight years old, my family moved to rural Illinois, not suburban Illinois, rural Illinois, okay? 
We lived in the Candlewick Lake community of a town called Poplar Grove. And the nearest town to Poplar Grove was called Argyle. And I still remember the population sign for Argyle. It said, welcome to Argyle. Population, 58 people, eight goats, one donkey. <laughs> the parking lot at our local high school accommodated tractors. We didn't have cable television. It was rural, not suburban, okay? And we were the only black family in Candlewick. And I was the only black child in the entire school. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say school? School district. We lived there for five years in an environment where no one looked like me, where the cultures and customs of my family were distinctly different from the cultures and customs of every other family in my community. My skin was different. My hair was different. My tolerance for freezing temperatures was different. <laughs> I was teased and bullied at times, and it wasn't super easy for me as a child. But what happened during these formative years of my life was that I realized I was never going to fit in in a traditional sense. So I had to completely abandon the desire to assimilate early in my life in order to adapt and to survive and to be happy. This ended up being such a blessing in my life. It's like I was completely free from conforming from the prescribed social definition of a girl because I was on the margin of what that was in my community anyway. I could laugh loudly, I could challenge the boys, I could be good at math, I could be competitive, sassy, extra, I could be executive. It was all sort of socially acceptable because there was no prescription for what I should or should not be doing because I was the only one like me. Interestingly, the time when it would seem like I would be the most marginalized was actually the time in my life that I probably experienced the most privilege. To have privilege means to have a special right, to have an advantage, or to have immunity granted to a particular person or group. I wouldn't have had this privilege if I had been one of a few black girls in my community. I was immune from social norms because I was the only little black girl for miles, and perceived immunity from social norms radicalizes the way you carry yourself in the world. When you don't think that you have to fit in, you carry yourself differently. The idea that traditional social norms didn't apply to me kind of went a step further as I entered high school. I always jokingly tell people that I was raised ugly. And here's what I mean. Growing up, I was close to both of my parents, but I was particularly close to my dad because he was my soccer coach and my trainer for my entire athletic career. He's like the African Richard Williams because he passionately coached both my sister and I to be world-class athletes, just like Venus and Serena. He demanded excellence of me just as he demanded of himself. And I remember one day when I was about 14 years old asking my dad if I was pretty. And what's interesting is that my dad answered in a way that most dads, and especially non-American dads would. He kind of looked at me with this incredulous, unbelieving look and maybe even a hint of disappointment. And he said to me, what do you really care about being pretty when you're as smart as you are? He actually said it with an accent, as you are. <laughs> Look, the jury may still be out on that comment. I doubt if you're going to find his response in a parenting book anywhere. Um, but his question had a profound impact on my perspective. In responding to my question with a question in his Socratic way, he was challenging me and empowering me to arrange my priorities in such a way that I could focus on nurturing my intellect and my gifts above focusing on my physical appearance. He suggested that anyone could be pretty, but I had the true privilege of intelligence. So I was raised ugly, 
But ironically, I would eventually sign a modeling contract with Wilhelmina and pay my way through graduate school by working fashion weeks. Another interesting thing about me is that I'm so much smarter than I look. <laughs> and of course, I mean to be facetious again, but it's true, and it's basically true for every female here, because the social expectations for women's intelligence are mediated by bias, and even more so for women of color. If you're a woman, both men and women may assume that you're less intelligent than your male peers. But we're so much smarter than we look, and there's something really important to learn from this. I was an intellectually gifted child, and because of this, I learned to only compete with myself. When you do a little research, you'll discover that giftedness is often multi-generational, partially due to your genetic predisposition, but partially due to the way gifted parents tend to engage with their children. My father, and actually my father-in-law, came to the United States during the African brain drain. And if you aren't familiar with this phenomenon, during the 1960s and 1970s, the most brilliant citizens of African countries like Ghana were given opportunities to legally enter the United States to attend college primarily. Basically, foreign countries hand-selected people with the highest intellectual potential, and many attended top schools, and many never returned home. Like my dad, they found love, and in thriving foreign economies, they found opportunities to work in fields that stimulated their minds. So my dad is an exceptionally smart guy, like perfect score on the SAT smart. And so is my father-in-law, he's a rocket scientist. I think they have about nine academic degrees between the two of them. They're really bright and interesting people, and my husband and I represent a little-known first generation of African-American adults, including former President Barack Obama, that have fascinating and often untold immigration narratives. Nevertheless, my mom is a master executioner. I learned how to get it done from my mom, and I learned how to think from my dad. My parents realized I was different at a young age. I was reading by three years old. I skipped first grade. I became communicative in my first foreign language in the summer. I eventually studied two more. I was an extremely empathic and curious child. I learned to play the flute. I was a leader and a problem solver. I learned that to continue to be stimulated and happy and fulfilled, I would have to be my own competition. The mind that I had and the body that I was born into was too much of a juxtaposition for our society. It was hard for the world to set the bar where it belonged for me. So I would have to set my own bar for success and creatively and resourcefully get after it. I was admitted to Columbia University at 16 years old and I became the first Ivy League graduate to compete in the FIFA Women's World Cup in 2003. I returned to graduate school at Columbia then I came to California and entered a doctoral program. I completed the teaching, uh, the coursework on a teaching fellowship, and I've had lecturing appointments and faculty positions at UCLA, LMU, and Occidental College. I've written a book, academic research papers, I've contributed to UN publications. I have given a TEDx talk, I've been invited to keynote at Yale, and asked by the government of Ghana to share my research on women's empowerment and health. I've coached my daughter's club soccer team, and I have two of my players here today. To back-to-back -to -back state cup finals, I've been asked to be the honorary head coach of LMU Women's Soccer. I started a nonprofit to help children around the world get a chance to change their lives through sports too. And I've been named a two-time back-to-back Los Angeles power couple with my husband and a dynamic woman by Modern Luxury and Angelina Magazine. Thank you. As was mentioned this year, I launched my own YouTube channel, Mom Peditor by Mimi Narte, to share my story and my journey and my beautiful and loving family with the world so that more people will know that families like ours are out there thriving. I do understand that I stand on the shoulders of Amazonian women who have come before me, and I've been able to do all of this because I challenge myself to be better. I'm intensely competitive, but I only compete with myself because there's no other appropriate opponent. 
And most importantly, I've been able to do all of this because I simply do not let anyone tell me what is possible. When you look on paper, I haven't had many advantages. I'm African-American. One of my parents is an immigrant. I'm a woman. I wasn't born into a rich family. There are many ways that systems of racism, classism, and patriarchy have manifested in my professional and personal life. But I've always used faith and excellence to cheat a system rigged against me. I've literally been denied opportunities because of racism and gender bias. And I realize that this bias and oppression is on a scale from subtle to avert. Often I've heard, we've decided to go in a different direction. You aren't quite a fit for our organization. You have great potential in research, but having kids can really derail your career. You may not have what it takes if you're too pretty, you won't be taken seriously. People won't really understand how to process you. We haven't really had a candidate like you before. And my personal favorite with the shameless look up and down. Wait, you play soccer? What's funny is that I hear the same subtext in almost all of these sentences and all of these statements. Any and all oppression in my life can be summed up in a single word, or, or. Or is a brilliant strategy to keep us oppressed. Not only is or the mother of stereotypes that keeps us from identifying with one another and learning to love and accept each other, or is the clever lie that is the foundation of every limiting belief that we hold about ourselves. Scholar or athlete, introvert or leader, Christian or scientist, black or gifted, minority or privileged, white or equal partner, confident or humble, smart or pretty. African or American, powerful or empathic, cooperative or competitive, feminine or feminine. Where people told me or, I've had to fight for him. And. and is rebellion. And is the battle cry of a species determined to be bigger than her place. Being bigger than your place means you're interested in expanding the scope of your influence. This is the process that actually drives evolution. Think about squirrels that live on a particular tree in the forest. Because they've been living on that tree for generations, they're extremely well adapted to survive on that tree. They're professional when it comes to life on that tree. Their place in life is on that tree. But what's amazing is there's always that one squirrel who's going to be bigger than her place. There's that one squirrel who's thriving on her particular tree, but one day she looks up and she sees another tree. And just like that, she decides she's going to leave what she knows and challenge herself to develop the skills to thrive on a new tree. She is going to pursue her end. And she's the type of squirrel that moves life forward. She is the type of squirrel that drives evolution. Because in order for life to move forward, we need species that desire to be bigger than their current place. We need and species. So even when I wake up feeling tired and unmotivated to fight for and, I press on because of the generations of women and men who will come after me who I believe will live in a better world where and is the social norm. I'm grateful for the opportunity to spend this day with you and to share with you some of my thoughts and hopes for feminism. 
with the hope that you will absorb these ideas, that you'll build on these ideas, and that you'll carry these ideas forward. Let the story of my journey inspire you to push past the or in your own life, because I am a scholar and an athlete, an introvert and a leader, a Christian and a scientist, black and gifted, a minority and privileged, a wife and an equal partner, confident and humble, smart and pretty, African and American, powerful and empathic, cooperative and competitive, feminine and an unapologetic feminist, and is the new feminism, and is my feminism, and I wish you all a life full of and. I was humbled that my speech was really well received, not just by the students, but by some of the other amazing women who had come to be panelists during the career day conference that was going on all day. I was really excited that after my speech, I got to sit on a panel with an amazing woman, Natalie White, who's a senior vice president at the LA Sparks. And we talked to several groups of girls about everything from finding your passion to work-life balance to just pursuing your dreams. It was really an awesome, awesome day. And just when I didn't think my cup could be any more full for that day, I met a young girl who is a player on the under 17 Guyana soccer team. And instantly she and I bonded and connected because we've had such a similar experience going back to play for the country that our parents are from. So it was such an awesome, fulfilling moment for me to have that little bit of mentorship plugged into the day. All in all, it was the perfect way to spend International Women's Day 2020.